Okay. Dr. Chimisi, if you can hear me, then I think we'll start now. Yes, if we are, I think, yeah, we have our speakers I'm ready, so we are good to go. All right. Okay. Let me use this opportunity to welcome everyone to today's workshop. My name is Ifwa Akuto Safubidiako, and I'm a process engineer with Ghana Gas Company. I will be your moderator for today. Today's theme is Young Professionals, Career Development, Career Opportunities, and then some experience along the way. I would like to give Dr. Riverson upon the opportunity for a brief opening remark. Dr. Riverson, can you please take the floor? All right. Um, please confirm you can hear me. Yes, I can okay, hear you. Great. Please go ahead. Awesome. So um, I also briefly want to welcome uh, everybody here and also to encourage um, our members, that's our SP members who joined today. Um, to, to, to stay throughout, to learn from today's uh, aspects. Um, it is of no, um, I'll say, uh, surprise that we have um, our own Mr. Tuedu, uh, for those who know him, even though the bio will be read, a renowned uh, expert in drilling, and my own mother, Dr. Juliet Chumasia Nochi joining us today. We are also very happy to have uh, Engineer Ifyom and um, also Jacqueline joining us. And I'm personally looking forward to learning a lot, even though it's for young professionals. I don't, I don't let it go stride, but also coming here to learn from the experienced ones we have here today. And as a matter of fact, this is to buttress uh, the mission of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, which is to collect disseminate and exchange technical knowledge concerning the exploration, development, and production of oil and gas resources. So we are here to make sure that the mission of, of SP International is accomplished. So please stay tuned and let's enjoy today's seminar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Riverson. Thank you so much for the remarks. All right, so as Elia said, the focus for this workshop is young professionals career development the career opportunities and experience along the way. Before we dive into what we have planned for the day, I would like to state some key points, please. Kindly take notes. Aside the panelists, please ensure your microphone is muted at all time, unless you are given the chance to speak. And also there will be time allocated at the end of the workshop for any questions. You can either use the raised hand icon or you could also type it in the comment section and I'll read it out on your behalf. All right then, we are honored to have four renowned speakers who are well versed in the oil and gas industry. With their expertise, they would enlighten us on our career development and how we can gain some experience and relevance in our line of career. I will now introduce our four respected speakers shortly. We have Mr. Atu Edu, a world operations and engineering consultant, and also the managing director of Solisev Ghana Limited, an upstream company that focuses on drilling completions and other oil field challenges. The next speaker is Dr. Juliet Chumesi Anoche, co founder principal consultant of Anogel Efriye and Co, an extractive governance lawyer and regulatory expert. Our next speaker is also engineer Efion Ekon, uh, the director New Energy Supplet Energy PLC, which is a Nigerian independent exploration and production company. Um, we also have Madam Jacqueline Jackson Cole, 
She is an oil and gas professional and a consultant. She has worked for various oil and gas companies and we would like to hear from our distinguished panelists at this moment. I would like to open the floor for them to share their brief profile alongside their experience. I'll kindly request that this is done within five minutes. That is for each of the panelists so that we would have ample time for our discussions. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, please. First of all, Mr. Atu Aid, we would like to hear from you. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for the introduction and uh, also to the SP Ghana session for organizing this uh, to uh, find a way of uh, helping young professionals in mapping out their career into the future. Um, as you've already mentioned, I'm originally from Ghana. Uh, oh, come I, I, <laughs> some, somebody's <laughs> mic is on. Is yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, I grew up uh, partly in Ghana, in Nigeria, and back to Ghana. Um, I attended St. Augustine's uh, College in Cape Hello? Coast. Can you hear me? Hello, Mr. Edu. Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Hello? Somebody was, somebody is trying to call me, that's why. Um, okay. So, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, after St. Augustine's um, College, I attended what is now um, the Accra Technical University, at that time, a polytechnic. And then uh, uh, after that, got a scholarship to the USSR in those days, uh, now uh, broken down with uh, uh, my studies taking place, first of all, in the Ukraine. Uh, where I studied uh, Russian language, and then to Moscow, where I did my uh, mechanical engineering, specializing in oil field equipment and drilling technology. So uh, that, that's uh, the initial part of my education and getting myself into the oil industry. I did another master's degree in uh, Robert Gordon. Uh, at that time, the uh, current well engineering uh, masters was uh, offshore engineering uh, course with two streams one stream being in uh, petroleum engineering and then the other stream being offshore structures so i said i went for the petroleum engineering option and um, while on the on the course um, BP at that time was uh, looking for a uh, drilling engineer through a consultancy, uh, two consultancies uh, for work on the Fortis field. Uh, so Fortis uh, has uh, five platforms, uh, you know, which I think are still uh, operational, but at a lower scale. Uh, so I went for the interview and then ended up starting my career in the industry with Alumax Engineering, which got the got me the position in a place in BP. Uh, once uh, I worked on the Fortis field and other uh, BP assets, uh, also joined uh, Talisman Energy, now owned by Repsol, um, and then uh, took it on from there, uh, going on into consultancy uh, back to BP in Algeria, uh, where we developed the Insala gas field in Aminas fields. Uh, then in 2004, I uh, joined British Gas uh, or BP, a uh, BG group at the time, and seconded to Kar uh, Karachana fields in Kazakhstan. And uh, since then, I've been uh, on the Karachagna project and then in 2017, moved on to Nostrum Oil and Gas, which is uh, a, a 
company based in uh, Belgium, but with assets in Kazakhstan. So I, I apart from that, I started uh, Solusev in 2009 with my colleague, uh, Mr. Emmanuel Kokwe, who looks after operations whilst I do uh, international consultancy and uh, supporting operations in Ghana as well. So uh, briefly, that is uh, uh, my background. And uh, I'm sure when questions come up, I will be able to contribute to help support the young uh, professional. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Edi. Oh. Thank you very much. We see you are a man of multinational experience, so we'll be able to tap a lot from that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now from Dr. Chumisi, can you kindly give us a little background? of your experience. Thank you. Dr. Juliet Tsuchumisi, uh, can you please hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. I had, I had to unmute. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a good morning. Uh, well, good nearly morning. good afternoon to SP Ghana uh, and to everyone who's listening. Um, thank you for this opportunity to share my experience. Um, I didn't start off as an oil and gas uh, professional. I mean, I would say that I fell into oil and gas uh, along the way. Um, as you know, uh, I'm a lawyer. I went to, I started in uh, Holy Child, uh, Cape Coast, um, subsequently uh, went to Andrew Memorial Sixth Form, and then went to University of Ghana, Ligon. Uh, I was in Mensa Sabah Hall and studied law. Um, after that, um, I mean, during our time, you won't believe it, you won't believe it, look at Ghana now, given the opportunities. But during our time, uh, opportunities were very, very slim. So most of us uh, just finished and then packed our bags and we left. Some went to the US, some went to the UK. So um, we all went to the UK and then uh, got jobs and then started working. So uh, my area of expertise was actually public law. And then I subsequently started doing antitrust. I was working in an antitrust, uh, doing uh, investigating cartels, um, that sort of uh, background. Um, I subsequently retrained as a lawyer in the UK as well, in addition to training in Ghana. And then uh, went on to uh, do uh, a master's in um, European law and antitrust, because that was really very much my focus. And um, at that time, I wasn't dreaming of coming to Ghana. So my focus wasn't very much on Ghana at that time. Um, so 2007, um, oil and gas, massive discovery in Ghana. And then uh, the light bulb just went off in my head. Now, about time to go home now. Uh, and things were also changing in Ghana in terms of opportunities, in terms of governance. In Ghana was basically different from the Ghana that I had left in uh, 1990. So uh, I, uh, my husband and myself, we came back to Ghana. So when we were coming to Ghana, um, of course, the first place I wanted to go to was to continue my antitrust work. Um, but unfortunately, there wasn't any such laws in Ghana. So I got a job. Um, I got a consultancy job as um, senior legal counsel at Ministry of Energy at that time. So uh, the law for Petroleum Commission was now being passed. Local content LI was being passed. So that was the, the world that I found myself in. So I did a lot of uh, oil and gas work at that time. Uh, I did a lot of um, power, work in power as well, uh, renewable uh, energy. So I had a very varied um, value. I did a few downstream type uh, things. And this was in 2011. And then, um, as you know, around that time, the Petroleum Commission law was then subsequently passed. So I was asked to go over to help the then CEO of the Petroleum Commission, uh, Dr. Honorable Dr. Kapradonko. Uh, and I think there were six of us to go and help him to publish the Petroleum Commission. So that is where I ended up, first of all, as um, a legal advisor. Just, uh, general legal advice on how to establish a commission, uh, everything that basically we all mucked in uh, just to ensure that the commission would be established. Uh, did that. And then after the local content was passed, I was made a consultant in charge of local content. 
and then um, in that capacity, I went um, on uh, the end of Jubilee, and then also 10, predominantly 10, and then uh, the ENI project. I was head of local content for all the local content for those two projects. So once, um, well, in my own view, in 2017, I deemed that my work was done because I was uh, 50 years old and I had told myself that once I'm 50, I'm going to work for myself. So my husband and I set up a consultancy, uh, which is Anujin Afriki and Company. He's also a lawyer. So uh, we decided to pitch our tent together rather than working for someone uh, so that we can ensure that all the money stays in house. <laughs> <laughs> So we set up Anujin and Free and Company, basically doing um, oil and gas stuff. Um, uh, we do both upstream and downstream. Um, and then currently, uh, interestingly, in addition to oil and gas, uh, since finally ECOWAS is now setting up a competition authority, uh, my competition law work has also picked up. So now I'm doing both. So I'm now doing oil and gas as well as my antitrust work, which is what I wanted to do right from the outset. So a uh, very interesting uh, life uh, for me at the moment. So I'm around, uh, most times I'm traveling, um, doing my galamse here and there. <laughs> but uh, fortunately today I was around, so uh, it's interesting just to participate in this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jelit. We are inspired by your varied experience. Uh, and at the moment, I would kindly ask engineer Efion okay. to kindly share his background with us. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to keep it short because today is about the young professionals. And uh, so thank you so much. I mean, it's a great pleasure to be here to in the midst of this amazing. I'm inspired by Artur and uh, Dr. Was it Dr. Julia that spoke last? Uh, yeah, because yes. I, I hope I can translate like you. I'm still caught up in corporate uh, <laughs> World. So I hope I can become an entrepreneur like you one day. So really as, as inspired. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Afford. Thanks, Dr. Riversin and the SP Ghana uh, section. So uh, I'll make it very short. So I started my career in 1992. I went to university in Nigeria. I did petroleum engineering and I joined Shell. I say, just like a lot of young people here today, uh, I joined uh, Shell as, as a reservoir engineer and that career took me to work in Nigeria, Gabon, Cameroon, when Shell was still big in the West African portfolio. I'm always a bit disappointed that Shell never really had major investment in Ghana, but um, so I worked that bit, resume engineering, working asset project operations, the strategy, uh, the whole shebang. And then I move on to the Netherlands, headquarters for Shell, where I worked in R&D on some real high end uh, research and then do, did a lot of studies, front-end engineering, design, FDP. And then I came back to Nigeria and then went back again to the US deep water wells, now running assets in the deep water uh, Gulf of Mexico. I worked on Perdido, Mass. You know, these are really multi-billion dollars, massive assets in uh, the US as an asset manager, formerly first as a production, general manager production. After that, I came back to Nigeria where I worked as chief reservoir engineer and then two Years after that, I then went to Qatar. Uh, I was vice president technical in Qatar, where I worked on the biggest project ever in the Shell portfolio. It's a $25 billion investment in GTL and also uh, train seven and train eight and LNG. These are mega projects. And then I came back in 2014 to become now the deep water uh, offshore business uh, general manager for Shell Nigeria. So I did that 2014 to 18. In that window, I was headhunted by uh, by Seplat Energy PLC to come in as the COO and also on the board as executive director. So since 2018, I've been with Seplat as the director now as New Energy. So in summary then, um, clearly I was developed by Shell. So all my training in Shell was all Shell courses. Although I did go to IMD Lausanne, Switzerland for leadership uh, uh, courses, so many leadership events. And then sometime in uh, when I was in, uh, in Seplat, I also went to Harvard Business School. And that's why you see I'm an alumni of IMD Lausanne, Switzerland, and I'm also an alumni of Harvard Business School. So in summary, those are my quick uh, my career experience. And one part I always talk about, I'm very close to Ghana, Ghana is always on my heart. So I forgot to say thank you, Abuna, who actually made this connection. And the reason my wife is from Ghana, uh, so I come to her cry a lot. So I have a lot of connection with Ghanaians, even though we still have the Nigeria and Ghana tension. <laughs> that's beautiful. 
So, so thank you so much. And Mida say, like we always say, a pleasure being yeah. here again. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome, Engineer Ifun. All right, Madam Jacqueline. Madam Jacqueline, can we have a brief background of your experience, please? Well, good morning, um, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, I'm originally from Sierra Leone, right? But uh, in my uh, towards my end of my secondary school, I had to move to Nigeria because of the civil war. So that's how I went into studying. Uh, at the time, I went into studying mathematics because, of course, from Sierra Leone, then there was no oil and gas, so I didn't even really know much about it then. So my first degree was in mathematics and it was after then I came into an opportunity to work for a company then in Nigeria uh, in engineering. And then uh, after a few years, I went on to the UK, Robert Gordon, <coughs> to do a master's in drilling and well engineering, right? Uh, I After that, I came back to Nigeria because of that then, I think within West Africa, Nigeria uh, had more opportunities right so i i worked um with slumberger then uh for about eight years um before i left and then i moved to canada i have done some work here also and uh just uh about a year ago i decided to go into consultancy and so i have um, uh gone back to ivory coast to do some work there so i go back and forth between ivory coast and here and even in 2015, I was in Ghana for a bit, uh, and even in uh, Ivory Coast when we when they did the first discovery. So mm -hmm. I have worked in the field. I've gone offshore. I've worked in the base in maintenance uh, because I'm a very handsome person, right? So uh, I look forward to sharing my experience and uh, the knowledge I've gained along the way with a lot of the young folks here. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Jacqueline. We really appreciate your time. Looking at the time zone in Canada, thank you so much for being with us once again. All right, so we'll dive straight into the questions. Uh, I would like to direct this question to Engineer Ifion. Because we have limited time with you, we want to tap into your experience as fast as we can. First of all, we would like to know, how did you identify your career? and also know the specific programs to study in that are in line with the career that you have in mind going forward what are some of the ways hello Bisma, can you please mute your microphone all right thank you all right i'll repeat the question again it's directed to engineer ifion and also, Madam Jacqueline, please. This question is directed to Engineer Ifion. All right. How did you identify your career and also know the specific programs to study in that are in line with the particular career you have selected? And then going forward, how are some of the ways you positioned yourself to have the maximum expertise in that career? Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a very, very rich question. Thanks for amazing question. Uh, to be honest, we didn't have the privilege you guys have nowadays as, as millennials and young people. So I will not stay uh, identifying my career. Um, uh, I'll say if I look back, some things in life is by luck, some by providence, some by destiny. I came from a very poor background, poverty, really, and I always, I'm never shy to, to, to share my background. So my parents were not educated. My mom was just a, a petty, petty trader. My dad worked for some really low level role in the government. So uh, growing up, all they told us was, you got to go to school, take your education seriously. And those days, you know what they always say, our parents would say, the only three things you can do, you can either be a lawyer, a doctor, or an engineer. That was the kind of traditional a background we grew, up, we grew up in. In my little way, I wanted to, I like piloting because I see planes fly. I never flew a plane in my life then. Um, I like to be a pilot, but my mom said, no, he doesn't want the son to, the first child to die. So don't go to pilot. So long story short, I was a science uh, person in school. I was top in my primary, secondary, and I find myself uh, admission to read petroleum engineering because the someone who then advised me then was, look, Nigeria has a lot of oil and gas. So why didn't you do petroleum engineering? So I would say, whether by divine or accident, I just found myself doing uh, petroleum engineering. My dad liked medicine. 
Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I felt, oh, I don't like blood. I'm not a blood person, but I was very good in mathematics. So if, if you put all that together, I'll say maybe it's just coincident or by accident and find myself in, in uh, petroleum engineering. And luckily for me, I left school in 91 when, you know, I mean, Nigeria is a mess now, to be honest, the industry is a mess. But then there was still some bit of sanity. And if you come out of university, top, top, top first class, for example, or high end, you got a job almost automatically. So I got offered a job by Shell, by Exxon and Total, but I chose Shell because my dad felt Shell was all over the world and was a better company mm -hmm. where you could build a career. In terms of, um, your second question was around um, specific, maybe I missed that, I didn't get that, just help me. Okay, how you positioned yourself to mm -hmm. have the maximum expertise? In okay. So, so that was a very difficult one, if I remember. How did I position myself? Now, of course, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Excuse me. So we didn't have all this, we didn't have all this thing you have today, but the good thing about Shell was Shell had a very clear career framework where you come in as a GT, the kind of roles you get exposed to, there's a career ladder you walk through, and it was very clear then my supervisor would tell me, please don't play too much politics early in your career. Focus on your onions. Get your basic foundation right. Reservoir engineering was what I was I, I was deployed to. Some of my colleagues were deployed, were just graduate trainees. We didn't have a clue about the industry. Some were went to like drill engineering or well engineering, you call it. Some were deployed to uh, to do surface engineering. So a whole, but that focused on the discipline part was what I said, okay, I wanted to become the best reservoir engineer. And I put a lot of in, effort into that engineering discipline. And then I remember the 70, 20 rule, which says 70% of what you become is a, a result of your hands on. So working to, to learn, your, get your hands dirty, get tough assignment, you get from your networking over time with Shell. And then 10% you only get about from your learning when you go for courses. So that's how I, I started working. And to be honest, it's not just about you working hard, which I'm sure you hear from, from the panelists. It's also about other people observing you, believing in you, and taking a risk in you to give you the opportunity. You on your own cannot survive because career is very complex. And I've been talking to Abuna since I started my mentor with her from working for the Ghana um, City Refiner. I forgot to she moved to Slumbergen now. And you see a lot of politics, whether you work in a national company or international or, uh, company, there's a whole lot of very complex dynamics. But for me, it was about focusing on what was important very early in the career, get the onion solid. So you can, when you talk, you speak from a position of authority and then you then get accepted all over the world. That's how I went to the US and I did extremely well. In the Netherlands did well in because I know my onion. So my advice is, you must invest time in knowing your onions. Later in your career, you then see that things like politics, all that comes to play. You must know your stakeholders who can influence your career, whether it's your line manager, some companies have learned and development, mentors, coaching. It's a whole broad range of stakeholders you need to manage. And then how do you also network with external? SPE, fantastic platform. Uh, I encourage you to join as many associations as you can. So it's a very complex, multi-dimensional space. There's no one size fits it all. You got to discover your own journey and maximize every opportunity you have that comes your way. All right. Thank you very much, Engineer Ifion. We've learned so much from what you said that you had the guidance of your father and also you should identify certain policies that may come your way to distract you so you do away with it. Thank you so much. Madam Jacqueline, I hope you can hear me. Yes, I can. Okay, right. so similar to what, what Dr. Okom said, right? So when I moved to Nigeria, I moved as a refugee from the civil war. My dad had died, so it was like my me, my siblings, and my mom. So of course, resources are limited. But by the time I, when I moved into university, again, similar, you know, those days our parents had very few limited career options for you, right? Um, so I went in to study mathematics because honestly, at that time, you know, now you guys have like platforms, people come to schools to talk to you about options. There were really no conversations. So I wasn't sure what I wanted to become. So I said, since I'm good at math, I'll just do mathematics. The mathematics was like a base platform for whether I wanted to pivot into engineering or anything. So let's just do that. And that was really how I started. 
that I got the opportunity to work in the oil field, right? And as I then, honestly, we were not allowed to go to the field. The best they allowed was like maybe go to a land location for a day and come back. But I kept pushing, right? And I think that, like uh, doctor said, is you need to know when you decide what you want, you need to start pushing and you need to dedicate. I dedicated the first four years of my life to technical, understanding the basics, because really in life, everything we learn, I mean, even the things you learn in university, you are not going to see them word for word. And there's no, we cannot teach every scenario. As you grow, what becomes the fundamental thing is application, is being able to apply the basics. So I focused the four years of my career to learning and understanding the basics. In fact, then, you know, as an African woman, then, you know, people will be like, oh, you're not married, you don't have kids. And I said, look, uh, you know, having come from a civil one, what I had experienced, I was more focused on developing my career, putting that strength into that. And as a first child also, right, you are, there's so much at stake, right? So it wasn't like, oh, go sit somewhere and, you know, start doing other things. So I spent those four, first four years strengthening my career. And like he said, he said one thing about as you grow up, there will be politics, but there are also people observing you. When I was doing my job in the indigenous company, right, I thought then we partnered with Slumberjay. And I can tell you, I was working with some of the operations managers. They kept coming every day for a year. And out of that, someone reached out to me and said, hey, what do you think about coming to join us in Slumberjay? We have opportunities. It was from doing that job. It wasn't like the pay was a lot, but it was the fact that they saw someone who was dedicated into coming every day, who was putting in the same level, going above and beyond and ensuring that integrity was important, right? So for me, I think that was really it. And, uh, you know, I used my past experience to strengthen me as I went along the way. And yeah, politics comes to play as you grow higher. Networking is important. And one of the things that I wish I had known sooner is things like license, you know, being on platforms like SP. Again, these things were not really available then. But now as we grow older, right, we see young people coming out of university and now you are like 40, 45 and you are like, hey, how do I fit in, right? It's making sure that you Whatever amount you earn, make sure you put something aside. There's something I call like groove money. Put money aside to develop yourself. Save money to do courses, to go on uh, programs, to go on conferences, because that's where you network. That's where you meet people. Get licensed. I know it's not very common to see, you know, license, but I know in Nigeria they have the Koren. They have other licenses. In the UK, they have licenses. Uh, in Canada, they have licenses. And a lot of them have pathways for non-resident licenses. So look into those things because it's become big now. It's not just enough also knowing the technical and knowing you have to network and also have the license. Uh, and I think that's what IT people enjoy. When I, an IT person has a license, irrespective of where they move to around the world, the license means that they are on that same level. So you need to bring yourself to that same level. And that's something I'm working on myself now. And I think uh, it's very important for young people to begin to put themselves into that opportunity, networking as they grow, and um, begin to look into license opportunities. Because once you are licensed, you are indirectly saying that, I am on this level with everybody on, I'm playing on the world stage, right? And that's very important uh, in positioning yourself. You know, it's not like what okay. we did before. Okay. Now you are, it's a different, and I'm sure in a few years from now, this whole thing is going to change again. So where you guys are now is about getting to be on that world platform where you are saying, even though I practice in Ghana, even though I practice in West Africa, I am equal to whoever is practicing in other places, even though the basins may be different, the crude type may be different, the equipment may be different, but I understand the basics and I can apply myself. Wow, very insightful, Madam Jacqueline. Thank you so much. One key thing that I can relate to is put money aside to develop yourself. Thank you so much for telling us so much. And well, the next question I'll direct it to Mr. Atu Edu. I'll direct it to Mr. Edu. With limited opportunities that are readily available for young graduates when it comes to the job market, you know, when 
people graduate from universities, the opportunities, the job market is very limited. Now, in your opinion, how should one position him or herself in their field of discipline? Okay, what values should they possess so that they will be the preferred choice for the particular job recruitment they have applied to? Hello? Please, we can't hear you. Your microphone is muted. Yeah, sorry, I, I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, the, the question uh, ties in with um, a lot of uh, things that uh, uh, Madame Jacqueline has, has said. And um, first of all, um, as a graduate, you may not necessarily know where you want to fit in. And like um, Dr. Efiong said, you know, if you're uh, lucky and you get uh, recruited by any of the big majors, they put you on a career path. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in BP, they they had what you call a challenge. And in my time, they uh, moved us around different departments. You know, I went to reservoir, I went into economics, I went. And then at the end of your challenge year, you, you, are, you know, basically have an idea of where you want to go. And uh, I started in reservoir engineering. I sat there and I said, no, I don't want to be looking at this computer. So <laughs> that led me into uh, well engineering. You see. So um, for a lot of the young people nowadays, it's, it's quite tough, I know, because I, I get a lot of uh, people contacting me and trying to find out how uh, they should get a job. Now, you need to develop yourself. One thing that I realize most people do is I don't have a job, I'm at home. Uh, and you ask the person, what are you doing at home? And so I'm putting in applications and so on, which means you are not applying yourself. So if, if you have somebody who has been applying himself, not necessarily within the oil and gas industry, but doing something else to keep himself busy, that's one, keeping abreast with your... Uh, knowledge that you've gained from the university. If you did petroleum engineering, you keep up with your, uh, you know, basic engineering principles. Uh, and, and just to prepare yourself, make sure that when you get the opportunity, you go for an interview, you are ready to answer the questions that they, they will ask you. And then showing that you have not been idle, but you've been, you know, gainfully employed either, it, it could even be helping your parents on a farm. That alone is, is, is showing that you're a proactive type of person. But if you sit and then say you're looking for a job, your chances of competing with someone who's been working on a farm at an interview will be, will be reduced. So you have, to, you have to engage yourself in some kind of gainful employment. Uh, on the other hand, you can also look at uh, educating yourself, doing some short courses, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, helping or volunteering your services, like uh, volunteering for SPE activities, helping to organize conferences, you know, and if you have the ability, if you have the means, you can actually, like uh, Jacqueline said, be attending conferences, workshops, keep yourself busy and up to, up to date. And read JPT if you're an SPE member, keep yourself abreast with new technologies and so on. So until you get yourself in the position where you have the opportunity to show what you know, don't be idle, you know, keep yourself busy. Um, then, uh, you know, one other thing too is apart from, you know, uh, yeah, I've mentioned the internships. You can volunteer to be an intern in a, a company, not necessarily uh, taking any money if you are able to uh, manage by yourself. And there are a few companies that will give you the opportunity to, to help them and then observe how you, you do your things. Uh, and like Jacqueline said, once you, you are observed, and Dr. Fio mentioned it as well, Everything depends on you as an individual. If you are the type who is laid back, waiting for instructions, there's no proactivity. Nobody wants a person that waits for instructions. 
you need to be proactive. You need to employ yourself. Even if they have not tasked you, you need to find something to do to support what is going on. If you sit back and you want somebody to instruct you, uh -uh, that doesn't work for me at Uedu, and I don't think it worked for Dr. Fion or Jacqueline. <laughs> so you need to get yourself involved. Don't sit at home and wait for a job. Get yourself doing something. And luckily one of the days something comes up and keep up to date, you know, the fundamentals, like uh, Jacqueline said, Jacqueline. don't miss your fundamentals. I mean, if you come for an interview with me and I ask you something uh, on pressure, that's simple as uh, F over A and you are mumbling, that for me is uh, <laughs> nothing to build on, you know? So you need to, uh, you know, like I always say when I talk at uh, the SP uh, events, Pay attention to the fundamentals, pay attention to the detail. Build yourself, if you are a technical person, if you are an accounting person or uh, petroleum economics, whichever area you're in, make sure that you get the fundamentals right. Build a strong foundation that the companies, whoever is going to engage you can build on. If you don't have that, there's nothing to build on. It, it, it might, you might not even get past the interview. So at any point in time, keep up to uh, stage with your technologies, go for short courses, don't be idle. If you have to do a master's, fine, you go and then spend the time doing the master's. And during that period, engage yourself in SPE activities. And like Jacqueline also said, the certification is also very important. You know, um, nowadays is, is more com uh, competitive during our time. I mean, we did not find it necessary to, to be certified, but now and in a lot of places, the certification becomes important. And SBA has a good certification program uh, and you can do it, get a test done, certify yourself so that you can, wherever you go, especially in Asia uh, and in other you know, uh, uh, countries uh, in Europe, once you are certified or chartered, then you have the opportunity to to um, uh, get uh, yourself employed. I hope that's uh, good enough uh, to to help the young folks. Yes, sir. If I it looks like we lost the four. She's still there. She's yeah. Frozen. She's frozen. She's frozen. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, she's she's out. She probably comes back in. Sorry about that. I'm having challenges with my next week. Sorry about that. Okay. So as Mr. Edu was speaking. Uh, he kept on mentioning be proactive, you have to develop yourself. And based on what he is saying, you know, as a young graduate, Hello. Yeah, hello. Okay, sorry. As Mr. Edu was speaking, he kept on saying, as a young graduate, you have to be see, you have to develop yourself. Okay. And as a young graduate, you know that coming out of school, you don't really have a lot of money. So you can also steal the idea from Madam Jacqueline that you have to put money aside all the time. So that right after um, university right after maybe your service, you can still go ahead and develop yourself whilst you wait for a permanent job. All right. Our next question will go to Dr. Juliet Chimisi. Dr. Juliet. Hello, doctor. Fifi, can you check, please, She's if Dr. Jacob is with us? 
Is she still on and all? Yes. Yeah, she's still on. Yeah, yeah doc, doc is still on now. Okay. All right, Dr. Jimmett, please, this question goes to you. Our question is that, how were you able to build or drive your career to have all these years of experience? And can you also share with us some of the challenges that you had along the line and how you were able to overcome them, how you managed to overcome those challenges? He's muted, I think. Hello, doctor. Can you please hear us? Hello, Dr. Jacqueline. Um, Fifi, can you please check? Maybe she's having issues with her microphone. All right. Okay. All right, then I'll direct this question to Engineer Ifion. Can you please give us some insights into how you were able to drive Hello. your career? <laughs> Hello, Dr. Jacqueline, good to have you. Good to have you back. Maybe I'll repeat the question for you. All right, Dr. Juliet. Hello. Sorry about that, I mixed up the names. Dr. Juliet, can you please hear me? Hello? Okay, mm. all right, we'll just, we'll just hear from engineer if you want. Okay. Yes, all right. the question, maybe I should repeat it, or did you get it, please? Oh, can you come back because I was confused, go ahead. Okay. Our question is that how were you able to build and drive yourself in your career to have all the number of years of experience that you currently have? And can you also share with us some of the challenges that you had along the way and how you were able to overcome them? Yeah. All right. Okay, thank you. Thanks for so so the first thing is I think everybody's experience is gonna be different. If you hear from my fellow panelists, I always say that university teaches you some bit of business skills, you know, problem solving, critical thinking. University never tells you whether you be a well engineer or as an engineer or geology, whatever, but those, those are the kind of skills you have to build. And I like the earlier conversation that don't be idle, you gotta be active and you see yourself as global resource. So you gotta be competitive wherever you find yourself. So it requires you to be resilient, to be dogged and be disciplined. The other thing, again, when I look back in our own career, why it's a bit of a tricky one is the future economy is different. Technology has come in big time. You see how even all and energy company are bringing technology, whether it's AI or augmented virtual reality. So it's a whole different world. You see energy transition coming in, renewable energy. But in my view, some of the elements that I see that are still applicable is number one, you got to start with the end in mind start with some clarity around what really is a long-term ambition and what's really going to inspire, motivate you. And you may not get the right kind of job opportunity at the inception, just like you heard from Atul, whether you start to work on a farm or in a manuf manufacturing complex or whatever, but you'll learn a lot. So start with that end in mind. Mm -hmm. And the earlier you get a bit of clarity around whether you want to be a technical expert or you want to be a generalist or you want to be a business person also comes in handy as you grow your experience. Prepare mm -hmm. a career roadmap. Try to have a career roadmap with options in that career roadmap because nothing is certain. So mm -hmm. what the career roadmap does is it shows you clear scenarios about how you can get to your ultimate long-term uh, um, uh, goal or ambition. Number three, four understand all the stakeholders you need to help you navigate that career roadmap. It's very, very important. You're gonna have different kind of people, your line manager, your supervisor, all that be mentors, all that. And number five, try and make sure you appraise yourself as you go through your journey because everybody's experience is gonna be different. I've seen young people who come in, they start as drill engineer or they start as resident engineer. They say, after two years, they don't like technical career path. They want to go to business. They take okay. a study leave, they go on study leave, go to a good school, do an MBA or whatever. So the options are, are, are actually a lot. 
And sometimes, mm -hmm. okay, I'm tired of corporate politics and all the mess. Let me go become an entrepreneur, open up a business. So in, there's so much options, so much opportunity out there. But those basics are going to be there. You've got to be disciplined. You've got to <laughs> develop yourself, get certification, be part of a network, invest in your social skills, get yourself trained by your own investment. Don't wait for your organization only to send you on training or development. Reach out. Hello and focus on that future economy opportunities. So I would say Hello, can you hear those, me? Are, those are some of the things I've walked through and I hope my colleagues also share more uh, insights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nathan. Dr. Juliet, welcome back. Thank you. I've been here all the time. I didn't go anywhere. It's just that I couldn't oh. hear anything. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Yes. Then I'll direct, I'll direct our question to you, the next question that we have. Okay, if you're, okay sure. Uh, we, we had the varied experience that you shared with us initially during mm -hmm. your uh, profile reading. And then we'd want to know how you were able to drive your career to have all these years of experience. And also, can you share with us some of the challenges that you've had along the way and how you were able to overcome them? Okay, uh, thank you. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, please, we can. Hello? Okay. We can hear you. We can hear you. Yes, I've, I've indeed had a, a varied career, uh, not because I planned it, but uh, like I said, uh, some of them happened um, along uh, the way. But I originally started off um, as a lawyer and like I said that time there was no oil and gas um, in Ghana and when I went into the UK uh, because I was very interested in government I got a job as a government lawyer uh, doing uh, public law uh, going to court judicial reviews uh, that sort of work and then as time went on and uh, Europe became um, very important to the UK uh, in the 90s at that time I decided that look, I was very interested in European law so why don't I just do a master's in the area and then get a job that fitted with uh, the master's that I had done? So that took me to uh, the antitrust uh, world. I did the master's first and then subsequently got a job with the competition authority at that time in the UK. Um, even though I'm not an economist, um, a lot of the work that I was doing antitrust work, there was a lot of economics uh, involved. So it was for me, it was... Um, I hope the video is coming. Yes, the video is coming. So for me, um, it was very interesting um, at that time. So uh, coming to Ghana and wanting to do oil and gas, um, uh, to be quite honest, I'm the SPE, uh, all of you are engineers. Um, I must admit that when I decided to do oil and gas, I didn't even know what an FPS was. I've never seen uh, anything like that. Uh, I was very interested uh, because I was coming from a point of view where I wanted to use my skills um, to help uh, Ghana at that time. So that meant for me, it was a huge and steep learning curve, you know, uh, an area that we don't know anything about. How do you even begin to understand it? And of course, I wasn't exactly 20 years old for me to say that I'm now going to go to school to go and get a degree. So um, a, lot of, a lot of the stuff that I did was self-taught. You know, I, I had to do a lot of self-teaching. Uh, find uh, textbooks and information that could help me. Uh, unfortunately, because I'm not an engineer, I wasn't in the very, very technical side. I was in the local content side, which really fitted with my skills. Uh, but then to understand local content very well, you also need to understand uh, the engineering aspects uh, of development. So what I did was I got myself two young engineers who were my mentors. Um, they were much younger than I was, but they were my mentors. And they were, uh, whenever we got the procurement plans and all the rest of it, I would sit down with them and ask them, what does this mean? Uh, what does this entail? Um, I went to uh, OTC so that I could get you know, a, a good perspective of exactly what it was that I was dealing with. And then uh, in the Petroleum Commission, one of the things that I did was that we used to have these study groups. Uh, we had uh, the engineering group, we had the geology group. And I used to go along to their meetings and I'm sure um, you know, most of the engineers used to wonder, what is this woman sitting here for? She's not an engineer. And the geologists used to wonder, what is she sitting here? 
for when I had you know, everything, I had a question about it. I had a question every single thing because I needed to really understand what it was that I was uh, dealing with. And then also, uh, like, you know, I've mentioned textbooks as well. Uh, I had uh, friends and colleagues, um, fortunately in Talu, uh, that I could rely on, that I could pick up the phone and speak to them and say, look, guys, um, this is what is on my table. What does this mean? Uh, what must I be looking for? So, um, you know, what I would say is that the big lesson that I learned is that no matter how qualified you are, you should be prepared to put aside uh, your pride. And then once you get into a new area, uh, don't look at the fact that I'm older than somebody or I have more experience. You know, if there is new things that you don't know, find people who can teach you, regardless of where they are. I mean, some of the engineers that I was talking about who were teaching me, I am I actually employed them. Um, you know, some of them were at that time they were assistant officers in the Petroleum Commission at that time, and um, most people didn't know that that is what I was doing. They would come to my room. And we'll sit there and then have you know, very long conversations. And you know, they would be teaching me, actually. And then I'd go to a meeting. And uh, you know, it got to a point where I had a meeting with uh, engineers in E&I. And they asked me, are you an engineer? I said, no, I'm not an engineer. They said, how do you know all these things? And you know, I best start laughing because, of course, I had my own secret tutors who were teaching me before I went into the meeting. So uh, that is what I would say. I didn't plan my career uh, the way it's turned out. But I've got to where I've got to through a lot of uh, learning from people, mentoring. I believe in mentoring uh, very greatly. So I always have uh, mentors at three levels. I have people who are younger or lower than me. I have people at my level and I also have senior people. Uh, and I look to all of them, uh, for all of them to teach me various, they all teach me various things. And of course, I'm sure, you know, they also gain from the experience in having me also a mentor, especially the, the junior ones. So that is what I would say. If you want a career, you have to be prepared to go for it. You have to be prepared to learn. You have to be prepared to put all your big qualifications and your pride aside and say, look, who can help me? Who can teach me? And whatever comes your way, you know, do it. When I joined the Petroleum Commission uh, in the beginning, even though I was a lawyer, I wasn't really doing legal work in the beginning because we were starting. You're ordering furniture, you're doing this, you're doing that. You're going around to various government departments. You're begging for resources, um, and you know it was one of the. It was a, it took about a year. It was one of the best years of my life because that experience gave me the opportunity to really learn about how government works. You know, if you want something from Ministry of Finance, how do you get it? You know, you don't just get it by writing long memos. You know, you go there and you're on the ground floor. There's no lift. They say go to fifth floor, and then you go to fifth floor. The other person is not there. Come here this, that, and the other. And at the end of the day, I became, uh, I would say that a rounded person in the process. And that continues to help me in my career. So I end up being able to do things that, um, you know, I wasn't really qualified, but I've learned. You know, I also did a lot of work with civil society. You know, uh, at that time, uh, civil society in Ghana was not very popular. But then I thought, hey, that's an opportunity for me to learn policy. So get involved with them, go to their meetings, go and do presentations to them. Um, you know, they can be very difficult to deal with sometimes, civil society. But, uh, you know, once you make up your mind that there's a lot to learn from them, there is a lot that can be learned. So uh, I think in a nutshell, that is where I would leave it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jilly. We appreciate what you shared with us. In progress. At this juncture, I would open to anyone who has any more questions. Our meeting has been moved forward by because of the time. Anyone with any questions, kindly use the read and on, or you can also type questions at the same time and I'll read it on your behalf. Anyone with a question, please. Our engineers, our doctors here, with all their years of experience. Where, something where, where are the questions? It. Why are these shy? Is SP uh, Ghana shy? Are these shy people? Come on, <laughs> come on, guys, ladies. Well, I have a question. Let me help them. I know some people may be shy, right? Uh, <laughs> a lot of the panelists that we have here today have talked extensively at, at their career, right? One of the things I have that I thought I was the only person 
doing was adaptability. How have we been adapting to the changes? Because one of the things from when we start age-wise, also you don't have the same strength. You know, you also move from being maybe single to having a family. You you have different commitments. You know, I like to hear from uh, Dr. Ocon. How have you had? Because you've moved a lot, different countries, weather, you know, food, culture shock. Uh, how have you uh, handled adaptability? Because it's one of the things that mm. I myself have found myself over the years having to do. And sometimes it's easy, you know, mm. but sometimes it's not easy because you also have kids. You have mm. uh, different things. So how have you handled adaptability and change of environment? I'm of the honest, that's a very, that's a very tough one. Um, <laughs> it it's, it's boils down to keeping an open mind to explore, to take risk. And, and this career comes with a lot of sacrifice. At some point, I almost lost my marriage because um, I was always either offshore or traveling all over the place. It's difficult, I got four kids. And at some point also when we moved from Nigeria to the Netherlands and then back with the you know, English curriculum, we went to the US, American curriculum. At some point I also got my children education all messed up. So. It's tough, I must say, uh, friends, colleagues on this call. It may sound easy the way all of us have shared our experiences, but it comes with a lot of sacrifice. But what I've come to realize in life is at some point you have to make some choices, and those choices come with consequences. There's never going to be a perfect uh, 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 exposure career for anyone. So my advice is just keep an open mind, be willing to learn, look a lot more into the future so that whatever sacrifice you're making today, it's something that you get the reward in the future, which is why I did mention that our industry is still going through a lot of transition. The beauty about oil and gas is that even though people want to lower carbon intensity energy, there's a huge discovery going around the world around oil and gas. Namibia, Mozambique, Ghana, it's all over the place. So it's just that we're saying that all is not bad, but the impact on the environment is what is bad. So we want to decarbonize our oppression. We need that cash to do. Mm. Develop, uh, and just to just try and, and adapt and all the step back from the time, do really that whole stakeholder, you must find ways to try and carry them along and sometimes stop and say no to some uh, uh, postings. That's my own experience. Thank, but it's hard. It's hard. Thanks. Um, um, can I, if we I think um, if, if we can have all our speakers train, um, sharing the experience on this question, that would also be great because um, I wanted to come in with that, the adaptability and um, the, the teamwork and the people you meet, different culture, as Jacqueline said. Um, I would really appreciate if um, Atto and Dr. Juliet, as well as Jacqueline yourself, you can also tell us we're moving from Sierra Leone to Nigeria and now in Canada. That would be great to hear from all of you. I think, um, okay, if I can just share my contribution. Um, because I said first, I moved from Ghana uh, to uh, the UK. And of course, right from the outset, it was a bit of a culture shock um, because the way things were done there was completely different from the way things are done in Ghana. And, uh, you know, Ghana is, even though we are an Anglophone country and we speak English, I can assure you, uh, the English that we speak there is not the one that we speak here. So uh, even working and writing, you know, one of the first challenges I had was, you know, writing. Um, you would write and think, you know, I've written it very well, but then you realize that no, 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 no that's not the way uh, they want it. So in the beginning, I used to get a lot of red through my work. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I needed to learn uh, right from the outset. But I know it's very you know, in Ghana, we're very friendly, we're very friendly, very chatty uh, at work. Uh, that's a completely different culture. You know, they're not very chatty, they're not very friendly like we are uh, over here. So in the, in the first few years, I was a bit lonely, uh, just learning how to adapt. Uh, but gradually, I, I adapted. And then when I came to Ghana, the problem was now readapting. 
you know, because um, even though you're Ghanaian, once you've lived outside, I see uh, Atto is laughing. Once you live outside for a very long time, you come back and yeah, outside you're the same, but internally your head is completely different. So, you know, that also took some time to understand, uh, you know, how things were, were coming to work in Ghana civil service, completely different culture. Um, you know, uh, I was coming from a system where you could just start to just do things, send the work and that's done. And I needed to come and learn, okay, you have to do this, put it in a file, give it to a messenger, the messenger will send it. It was all very confusing uh, for me for the first year or so. It was very confusing to finally get back. And then, like I said, when I got into the oil and gas sector, you know, completely different um, world, uh, completely different, um, uh, completely different principles completely different people, how do you adapt? And it takes a lot of commitment and a lot of determination to decide that, look, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to adapt to. And that it's an ability to be flexible. You know, sometimes we are not flexible. Sometimes we say, this is the way it's got to be done. And that is exactly how we want it to be done. But is the, if you want your career to go into varied places and different places, is the ability to, you know, tell yourself that I'm going to adapt to the system. This is a completely new system. And then I'm going to be humble enough to change the way I think, change the way I see things. Uh, ask people to help. You know, a lot of times you need people to really uh, help you. You know, you go to now I travel around uh, West Africa quite a fair bit uh, to do my galamsey, as I call it. And then you go and then, you know, even though we are West Africa, you still need people to show you things. You know, the culture is slightly different from Ghana. Uh, the way you address people is slightly different. And a lot of it, you need people to really hold your hand and then show you how to do things. So uh, that is how I have uh, lived my life and how I've tried to adapt. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Juliet. Frederick Asaga, kindly proceed with your question. Wanda, please prepare, you are next. Frederick Asaga, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Hello, Frederick. You can go ahead. We are listening. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you? I can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, my question goes to any of your your guests. Um, please, these days when you tune into the commercials that advertise job opportunities for new for job seekers, you hear this where that keeps frightening people, job experience. These days, they tell you five years and above. And uh, I had one of the guests who were telling us that when she first started, she didn't even know of, she, she's not head of FPSO, but I she was able to maneuver her way throughout. So what's her advice to the youth of today who are seeking for jobs and they come across this job experience and which, Sometimes we don't even have it at all, or yet we want to also break through the job market. Thank you. All right. We will direct this question to, uh, unfortunately, engineer Fon had to leave because he had some other things scheduled at the same time. So that's unfortunate. I'll read his closing remark at the end. Uh, Mr. Adu, can you please take this question for us? Yeah, um, <laughs> job experience, that's, that is very uh, interesting. But um, I'll, I'll use my own uh, as, as an example. Um, when I, I mentioned about joining Alomax and um, being placed with um, uh, BP for a start, at that interview, um, there were 57 people. They wanted one person. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of them had experience. I was virtually at Robert Gordon at the time. I didn't have any experience. The only experience I had was uh, working while I was in Ghana uh, at a brick and tile factory. And then uh, during summer holidays in the Soviet Union at that time, you had to spend 
a couple of months uh, in the field. That was everything that I had. Uh, but I ended up being the one that was selected. And it all came to what uh, I, you know, I said at the interviews and then the tests that were done. Uh, maybe I was lucky. So some element of luck is, is required. The difference nowadays is that a lot of the companies use recruitment agencies. And these recruitment agencies uh, tend to review CVs and then basically um, drop any CVs that do not meet the criteria. So going through uh, job applications where the, the requirement is to have some amount of experience uh, puts people at a disadvantage in terms of being able to even get to the, uh, to be called for an interview. So in, in, in that case, you will have to re-strategize and think about ways of getting yourself uh, uh, you know, seen. Uh, one, one, of, one of the ways is to find a way of visiting the companies and trying to meet people. And like uh, has been mentioned before, uh, find a way of going to, to uh, events that you can network to meet people that may be able to uh, give you the opportunity to, to, to be seen for an interview. So the, the strategy has to be totally different from uh, at least when we, we were younger and uh, the opportunities uh, was, was approach was different. So, you know, I think that's uh, the way that I see it and, you know, keep working at developing yourself and making the approach to companies such that you, you'll be uh, able to uh, be recognized. Uh, you know, so if you're going through that process of applying for jobs uh, through that are using uh, uh, agencies, to recruit, then it, I would say that, you know, to a larger extent, you may be wasting your time. On the other hand, you can uh, tailor your, your CV as well to show what other jobs you've been doing that uh, when the CV is reviewed, may be seen as you putting yourself uh, to good use and not just um, uh, you know sitting without a job. Uh, I don't know if that is helpful, but uh, you know that's that's what I've got to say on it. Hello. Yeah, Jacqueline, maybe you um, have something. Yeah, I was just going to say. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? I was just going to say that um, the uh, you know what you said was right, but I also want a lot of the young professionals to understand that you know uh, a lot of companies asking for experience. It's not just at the young professional stage, right? It's uh, even we. Uh, over the years also experienced this. Like now I moved to Canada, right? And they say, oh, you need Canada experience, right? So you find yourself that, okay, you've worked in, you know, different region because uh, wh wherever you've worked, depending on the region, right? Things are different. The type of uh, resources, the type of uh, geography of the location, the type of well, the drill, the type of rigs, it's all different. So. This is something you will experience throughout your career. Uh, they would be asking for experience, experience, experience. And even when you have experience, you might not have the exact experience. You might work with a company that uses SAP, for example, and you, you move to another place and they say, oh, we're looking for experience in one other technology that you do not have, uh, like he said. You know, so it will happen across your career. How is having a plan of of what how you can sell yourself is very important and sometimes it might mean also having to choose when i started my career for instance i had to start with an indigenous company right a lot of times the smaller organizations uh might be a little bit open-minded but what i've oftentimes seen is that a lot of the young professionals be like oh i don't want to work for this local company you know the money is too small i only like they come out of school like oh i only want to work for bp shell to town boom and that's it right they do not open their borders to 
other opportunities or oh, I want to start in this field. I want to be a reservoir engineer and they do not open them. When I started with the indigenous company, I actually started as an admin assistant. And while I was in the admin, I worked there for a year and then there was that opening in the engineering, then I transferred, right? So these, there are many ways to get started, but uh, Experience would always be something that will be will come into your career, whether as a young professional or uh, years into your career, right? So keep that in mind and do not let that be a stumbling block today. There are things you can control and there are things you cannot control. Focus on the things that you can control and do not beat yourself over the things that you cannot control and find a way, uh, you know, they, they say there are a hundred ways to milk a cow. Find a way around getting yourself what you need and be very open-minded. That's what I'll say. Because we we also, at my stage, after how many years of experience, at 40, I'm here in Canada and I'm being asked for Canadian experience, right? It took me, in fact, I had to start with an, a construction company to work as an engineer there before I was able to pivot, right? Because they were the first people that gave me an, an opportunity. Uh, so I had to do construction for a bit before I was able to pivot back into oil and gas. So, you know, keep that in mind, that it's not just young professionals that experience this. Um, if we're, you're mute, you have muted yourself. Oh, thank you, Fifi. I was saying thanks to Jacqueline for sharing her own side um, of Frederick Asake's question. Thank you for contributing to that. Um, I've been informed also that Dr. Juliet will be leaving soon. We'll kindly uh, give her the platform for a closing remark. Dr. Juliet, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Uh, if unfortunately I'm driving somewhere, so I need to leave. I think it takes me half an hour, so I need to leave uh, early. Um, I think in relation to the last question that was uh, asked about how you get in when you have no experience, I think the, the focus is on something that Mr. Atuidu said at the end, is transferable skills. You know, it's not uh, sometimes, uh, you know, I, in my own personal experience, even though I wasn't an oil and gas professional, I was a lawyer of so many years experience. So I got in because they started off by looking for a lawyer. And that was the basic qualification that I got, I got in with. So once I got in, then I needed to now learn the technical aspects uh, of the work. So don't just look at yourself and think, I have uh, you know, fixed yourself and say, look, I definitely want to do this particular thing. I don't have the experience. Look around and say, look, what are the other things that you can do that perhaps in future could be transferable? Uh, you know, I, I've seen people who, uh, have wanted to get in the oil and gas sector. They want to teach, you know, they want to teach uh, in an academic institution and try to use that as a pivot to get into uh, the actual uh, industry, uh, working in the industry. So sometimes that is the way you, you need to look at it. You need to look at it from a broader perspective and then see how best you can fit in. Uh, but having said that, uh, because people are using recruitment agencies, like uh, Mr. Twitter said, it's very challenging uh, these days, you know, in the early days when the industry was young in Ghana, it was it was it was easier uh, because you know it was new and uh, everyone was looking for someone. Now it's becoming more challenging, and I would say that the way around it is to perhaps network more. You know, there is a, the HR professionals say that majority of vacancies are not advertised, and I've seen that in practice where people have recruited people without going through the mail. So. Uh, internship these days has been done to a death. People have done internships, they don't get anything out of it. Uh, what I would say is that network and network and network. Talk to people, uh, members of SP, senior members, engineers, talk, talk to them. You know, you never know, an opportunity might be available somewhere. And, you know, like Jacqueline said, don't look at the money because sometimes that is also the problem. You know, people say, look, I can't live on this. I want to start off on 10,000 Ghana days. It's not going to happen. You know, so sometimes you need to be prepared to take something small so that you use that uh, as a means of climbing up the ladder. And then, of course, as you climb up the ladder, the dollars and all the rest uh, will come and then you have a successful career. 
So unfortunately, I have to leave, but I want to say a very big thank you to SP Ghana for this invitation. Uh, thank you to my colleague uh, panelists, and uh, I hope you continue uh, and have a fantastic uh, workshop. Thank you so much, and have a good afternoon. Bye. -bye. Thank you very much, Dr. Yes, you too. Bye. Okay. We have some questions in the comment, but unfortunately, Fifi, I had to rejoin again. So they've all cleared. If you can kindly read it for us. Hello, can you hear me? I think the 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 other questions um, that I think we can ask um, Jacqueline and Atu to put through more light as well as maybe give their closer remarks will be in relation to um, job search and recruitment, especially in this transition, energy transition period. Yeah. So someone's trying to find out what um, we young professionals should do or what we need to attain or what we what values we need to possess especially around this time that a lot of people have done particular engineering but mm -hmm. the industry is looking for other uh, uh, engineers to recruit Jacqueline can you please take this question for us okay so uh, one of the things I would say um, Yes, there is transition and there is um, a lot of changes happening in the industry. But one thing I want us uh, as engineers or as young professionals to, to see is that when you, let's say, for instance, you study petroleum engineering, when do you actually start doing specific petroleum engineering courses? Somewhere in your third year or fourth year. You, every university will still teach you the basic engineering courses at the beginning. So as you go through the entire university, you are learning much more than just how to become a petroleum engineer. You are learning much more because when you start with your first year, they teach you basic everything, everything, not just even engineering. It's engineering, math, statistics. So keeping an open mind is one of the things I think we need to do as young professionals. You know, if we are narrow-minded and all we see is I want to be a petroleum engineer. I want to be a reservoir engineer. And this is where the challenges begin. As an energy transition person, right, you know, you need to apply everything that you have learned in school, right? All the physics, all the chemistry, all the mathematics, all the statistics, and find your, be able to adapt yourself into the new environment. Everything you've learned in your degree program is adaptable in the current energy transition. That's the reality. But a lot of people are not seeing this because they are just seen through one road, which is I want to be this specific thing and are not able to apply themselves into the various aspects. Honestly, um, a little bit may be needed in terms of attending, a, getting a few uh, courses or certifications along the way. But there are a lot of um, programs out there that are, not so expensive. Some of them are actually even free that you can attend and do to be able to learn um, about energy courses, the new energy courses that are coming up. But the basic engineering that you've learned in school will allow you to still fit into the current energy transition. That's the reality. So I want our young professionals to please open up their mind into the industry, into what is going on. Your ability to be flexible will come a very long way. Like I said, to you guys also, and for people who have checked my LinkedIn profile, I've also worked in construction, right? Which is part of civil engineering. I didn't study civil, but the reason I was able to fit is because look, in construction, what do we have drawing? Drawings is basic engineering. Your ability to interpret drawings is basic engineering. It's basic, basic mathematics. Understanding, um, for instance, how many inches make a foot. That's basic. Those are basic. Those were things I was able to apply into reading construction drawings. The things I had to learn were basically, okay, what does this symbol mean in plumbing? Or what does this symbol mean in, con in concrete? But I was able to read uh, drawings. I was able to do estimation. 
which even as whether you're a petroleum engineer or any engineer, you do cost engineering, right? So these are things I was able to do even though it was in construction. So I want us to please be open-minded, even though you have studied petroleum engineering, if you go through that entire course from 100 level to 400 or 500 level, there is so much of that course that is actually basic engineering and basic knowledge that you can actually find yourself transferring into what is happening in the industry right now and tell yourself, okay, what then do I, you do like a skill gap analysis? What then do I need to then bridge whatever is left of the gap? Do I need to do a little course? And a lot of this, uh, thanks to COVID, whether good or bad, a lot of universities today have a lot of online programs. A lot of online material is there. It's being able to identify uh, some of this online. I'll try to send maybe across a few on, I don't have them off the top of my head, online schools and online uh, colleges that you can actually apply and get a couple of programs. For instance, I'm doing a course now that is run by uh, a, co a, a university in Australia. I just have to deal with time difference, right? So learning continues. If you guys are complaining, what happens to all of us that are old? I'm in my 40 right now and I'm thinking to myself, oh, I have to learn this whole new thing. And probably in, so when I'm 50, there's something new I will need to learn. So, but I am not worrying about what I do not have. I'm analyzing what I have and I am asking myself, what do I need? It may be one, it may be two courses to bridge the gap, but we are all going through this transition. And I think resilience is important, but please do not just tell yourself because I study petroleum, all I have to be is a petroleum engineer. That is not true. A lot of the courses you do are basic, engineering courses that you can apply to any industry, any industry at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. We appreciate what you've shared with us. On that note, I would like to draw attention to the fact that SPE provides certification programs, and these are all available on our website. Also, if you are not part of our WhatsApp group, kindly reach out to Fifi or two at the end of our session and you are due to it. All right, because our time is far gone, we'll take the very last question and the rest of the questions in the comments section, we will answer privately to you later on. Kindly bear with us. We are already 30 minutes uh, gone beyond the time we allocated. Okay, Mr. A, please, this question is to you. What would you advise, what advice would you give to someone who wants to transition from academia, that is teaching, into the industry, especially someone without any field experience? Yeah, um, transitioning from academia into the industry is it, yeah. uh, virtually almost like a, a graduate who wants to enter the industry. Um, however, the difference is that with an uh, academic background, depending on uh, the degree that one is holding, uh, you can look at uh, potentially research positions within some of the organizations. Uh, and that could be a very good means of entrance to, to, to the industry. Uh, for instance, uh, if we you know, take the services companies, a lot of them have their research facilities where they look for people with strong uh, theoretical backgrounds that can be uh, used once they are trained to, to do the necessary research for developing new technologies and the likes. So normally they look for people with strong uh, theoretical background, which basically falls into the academic area. Um, I don't think it's, it's much different from any other individual who is uh, looking for a job without the necessary experience, which we've already discussed uh, before. So you just need to uh, work on developing yourself in uh, specific areas. Nowadays, 
something like data science is very, very important. Your uh, ability to analyze data, uh, to process the data, put it in uh, you know, easily readable form, uh, like the graphics, uh, it's, 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 it's a good skill to have. So, so you develop yourself in, in that, those areas. You also look, like we've mentioned before, at short courses, Jacqueline has stressed on that. And because you're coming from academia, your fundamentals will be quite strong. So for a lot of companies, that will be something that will be of interest to, to them as well. So just uh, make sure that you, you keep up developing yourself and showing what you can do that others cannot do. Uh, like I, I've just mentioned about the data science. You can also take some courses in data science. Some of them are free. I've seen a lot of free data science courses uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, you can use LinkedIn resources uh, and also to advertise your, your interest to, to look for jobs on LinkedIn. It's a good uh, platform for, for, for looking for uh, a job. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's all I've, I've got to say on that. And don't give up. If, you know, the, the main thing is not to give up. You know, uh, if at any point in time you feel that you need to talk to people uh, who might give you one or two ideas, and Jacqueline's approach is very practical. Don't limit yourself to say the oil and gas industry. And like um, a lot of times when we are speaking to graduates, uh, a lot of the companies don't necessarily go for a degree in petroleum engineering. You know, especially the services companies uh, tend to recruit from the other engineering uh, if, if they are looking for engineers and not necessarily only petroleum engineers. So apply yourself, look for jobs that um, will show that you, 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 you're doing something useful uh, in other areas and then keep applying until the, the opportunity uh, presents itself. I hope that has been useful. Yes, that's been very insightful. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, thank you. Unfortunately, because of our time, we would have to close and I'll be giving the closing remarks. But before then, I would like to assure those whose questions and requests have been sent to the comment section that you would all be attended to. Kindly bear with us. Okay. So on behalf of SP Ghana Session, I extend profound gratitude to our panelists, to Dr. Juliet Chumisi Anoche, who has, she has already left us, um, to Mr. Atu Eidu, to Engineer Ifion Okon, to Jacqueline Jackson Cole for this insightful discussion, taking time off your busy schedule and meticulously preparing us all for our careers ahead. We so much appreciate your time. And the lesson learned from you uh, has been very, very insightful, as Elia said. Thank you so much and long live SPE. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.